Consulting Officer at Upstart, who will be our moderator for today for this very important conversation. So, Aliza, over to you. Great. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's so delightful to have all of you on this call, and I hope uh, as we move through the conversation that it will actually be a conversation and we'll get to hear your uh, questions and bring them to the panel for discussion. Um, as uh, Shira said, I am Eliza Mazur. I'm the Chief Field Building Officer for Upstart. I'm going to moderate today's conversation. Um, I want to thank you all for joining this second call in the Lifting the Rock series focused on the aftermath of Charlottesville and funders' strategies to address hate. Uh, for those of you that participated in the first conversation a few weeks ago, you had an opportunity to hear from activists on the front lines of work to advance civil rights and to counter racism, uh, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate. If you did not have a chance to participate in the first call, you can listen to a recording of that call, which can be found on the JFN website. And as was mentioned in the previous call, there are strong historical precedents for what we are seeing today and longstanding involvement of the Jewish community in countering hate and protecting civil rights for all. Uh, today, our conversation is going to shift a bit to focus on the unique role that funders can play in these tumultuous times. We're going to hear from four funders. We're going to hear from Aaron Dorfman, who's the president of Lippman Camphor Foundation for Living Torah, from Lisa Eisen, who's the vice president of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, from Georgette Bennett, who is with the Polanski Foundation and also the Jewish Funders Network board chair, and from Isaac Luria. Uh, Director of Voice, Creativity, and Culture at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. I'm just going to describe the flow of our conversation, and then I will open it up to each of our panelists to share some opening remarks. So I'm going to offer a framing question to our panelists and ask each of them uh, to respond to that question. They're each going to have five minutes uh, a piece to respond to the question. I'm going to facilitate a conversation among our panelists, and then we will be opening it up for Q&A. Um, we will also give each of our panelists an opportunity at the end to offer some synthesis of what we've heard in the discussion. So to open our conversation, and Aaron, I'm going to ask you to go first, um, take us behind the curtain uh, at your foundation and share some of the animating conversations that are happening uh, around recent events what's being discussed at the board table, among staff and trustees, and with grantees in the field. Um, what are some of the areas, areas of greatest concern? And where has the foundation uh, been engaged in rapid response? Great, thanks, Eliza. Um, and uh, thanks to my fellow panelists and JFN for convening this conversation. Really honored to be on this uh, on this panel around this virtual table. Um, I, I'm going to like right start right away by saying by sort of expanding the aperture. Um, for us, uh, Charlottesville wasn't the wasn't the inflection point. Charlottesville was a not surprising outcome of. Uh, challenges that, that we as a country and as a community have been facing for a long time. Um, so the, the conversation around our board table about Charlottesville was very much like, oh yeah, we, you know, this, this, this seems like an obvious outgrowth of things that we've been, we've been observing for quite a while. Um, and we've been torn, I think, all along uh, between wanting to respond quickly and wanting to respond smartly. And so we're trying to do both of those things. Um, I'll say uh, a little bit about the foundation just for a moment that Littman Canfer Foundation for Living Torah is focused on helping Jews apply Jewish wisdom to live better lives and shape a better world. And uh, even in our um, response to this political moment, which uh, goes back to last November, um, that's, our, that's the animating kind of mission that has, has been the, the focus for our work. Um, so in terms of our, our response and how we've been uh, talking about this, uh, this, this very complicated political time, uh, uh, we've, we've drawn a, a pretty important distinction for ourselves uh, conceptually between um, the, and, and I'm going to speak very specifically about this, this political administration, the presidential administration, and the, um, I'd say the both cause and symptom that Trumpism as a political force uh, represents for our country. Um, uh, the distinction is between the challenges that um, the, the, the Trumpism movement, the, the demagoguery and populism of that movement uh, pose to us as progressive Jewish funders and as people with progressive Jewish values, 
uh, things around reproductive rights and LGBT rights and immigrant rights, and a separate set of challenges that we feel like are um, distinct and interdependent and equally important, which are the challenges posed to democracy. Uh, challenges around um, freedom of speech, uh, around freedom of the press, challenges around the independent judiciary, um, uh, attacks on uh, other uh, branches of government and the separation of powers, challenges to voter rights and things like that. Um, so we've been very focused on that second bucket, which seems uh, like it's getting potentially less, uh, less attention and, and merits a, a, a particular Jewish response. Um, and the rationale for the Jewish response from our perspective is that um, American Judaism is, uh, is really a, a unique historical phenomenon, right? It's, uh, it's a hybrid of Jewish tradition and culture and the culture and tradition of American democracy. Um, it's different from 19th century Polish Judaism and 21st century Israeli Judaism. Um, and in that respect, uh, we really depend on a thriving American democracy for our, um, for our survival as a community. So it really feels existential to us. Um, so that's the, that's the conceptual piece in terms of the, the practicalities of how we've responded. Uh, shortly after the election, um, our board gathered to talk about how we wanted to respond and made a, uh, a significant decision to expand our giving for 2017 by 40% to dip into the corpus and really uh, uh, double down on investments related to um, our, our Jewish values in this political moment. Um, and we've been, we've been allocating those resources in, in four different ways. Um, one is through some, some specific grants related to responding. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. We, we funded uh, Trua to bring together its network of rabbis uh, shortly after the inauguration to strategize about how they were going to respond in their communities. Um, we made a grant to uh, Resetting the, Ameri the American Table, which is an organization that's focused on uh, dialogue between uh, American Jews, uh, who, who represent different perspectives on Israel. And they ran an experiment this summer to bring together Trump voters and Clinton voters in Southern Wisconsin uh, to talk about how, how we can learn from each other and begin to rebuild dialogue across, uh, across ideological divides. Um, so we've been doing grant making in that area. The second is that we've partnered with a number of uh, other donors to, uh, to strategize about how their philanthropy might shift. Um, we've convened a table of donors along with uh, a colleague foundation uh, to who, people who are uh, what we would call activated but uncertain about how to respond and looked at the resistance funding landscape, looked at the, uh, the civic engagement funding landscape, looked at the political and electoral map for the next couple of years to see um, where there might be opportunities for our, uh, our principals to get involved. Um, the third is that we're partnering with the Jewish Education Project here in New York City to uh, run a Jewish Futures Conference in December uh, focused on the role of civic education in the Jewish educational landscape. So how does, uh, how does the Jewish community take up, um, uh, what was it, Schoolhouse Rock, right? Schoolhouse Rock, which animated literally my childhood with like how a bill becomes a law, we've lost a lot of that civic education in America and, and uh, we really wanna put it back on the map for and on the agenda for the American Jewish community. Um, and the last is that we're working with a number of uh, foundations, uh, Jew other Jewish foundations to talk through and think about whether there, there should be a Jewish collective response um, from the philanthropic community and from the, the social impact community um, in support of democracy and these core, these core values and principles that I talked about earlier. So that's how we're, that's how we're moving forward. Happy to, happy to talk more about it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Wonderful. Lisa. Okay. So like Aaron, um, this is about Charlottesville for us, but it's not just about Charlottesville. It's really about the last, I'd say, at least two years of degeneration in the American political and social discourse. It's about what's happening on college campuses. It's about teens facing anti-Semitism and bigotry in their communities. Um, and it's about anti-Semitism, but it's really about just these much larger forces of hatred and othering that are going on in, in our country and sadly in our world. Um, so our foundation is, focused on unleashing the power of young people to make positive change for themselves and for their communities in the world. And that plays out in a whole education agenda. It plays out in our Jewish life agenda and also child maltreatment and, and other areas in which we're involved. Um, and so 
I think like many foundations and nonprofits today, we find ourselves in this dialectic of we have a mission, we have a strategy, we have goals, we have metrics that we are focused on, on in each of our key uh, program areas. And on the other hand, we can't ignore these forces that are being unleashed in the broader society, both as you know, Americans and as Jews, we feel that we have an obligation to do something beyond um, that, that mission. So, you know, we're trying to navigate to what extent do we stay on strategy versus we be reactive? How, how proactive are we? How responsive and reactive are we? How smart is it to go fast and in, in, um, in reaction to the question here? Like, is it always the best thing to go fast? And um, so rather than get too specific about, you know, every, every specific thing that we've done, I, I'd like to just offer maybe a framework that I think might be helpful in how we think about um, this moment and frankly, any kind of moment that feels reactive, uh, uh, whether it's all the unprecedented disasters that are happening or the political and social forces that are unraveling. So, um, we look at three things. What is our existing framework? You know, do we have grantees who are already working on these issues? Are they as positioned as well as they could be to, to handle this moment and to respond to this moment? Two, are there new funding needs that are emerging um, where we could be particularly helpful? Um, would this be a one-time infusion or would this be a longer term new investment? And then three, what other tools do we have at our disposal in philanthropy um, whether it's our voice, our convening power, um, what have you, to draw attention to an issue. So just to go a little bit deeper, we really ask ourselves five, five questions. Um, and as a foundation, the first is, are we going to have a grant-making response? And um, so in the wake of, uh, you know, what's going on in the country this year as a whole, and also in the wake of Charlottesville, um, we first look at what's our existing grantee framework and what can we do through our grantees? And um, I just actually came out of the BBYO board meeting and I was thrilled to hear that in the wake of um, Charlottesville, a new BBYO chapter, teens reached out, they said, we wanna get involved. Um, they created a chapter in Charlottesville and they are working uh, with the Hillel at UVA to create a huge multicultural Shabbat where they're gonna be reaching out to um, other ethnic and religious groups across uh, the city to, to come together. So that's just an example of how, you know, two of our grantees, BBYO and Hillel, are working um, through their existing missions, but to, to respond to the moment at hand. And I can go into many more, uh, many more like that, but we, we are working with current um, grantees facing history as a, as a grantee that uh, we just brought on this year, both from our education side and our Jewish side to address the, the bigotry that is going on in, in, uh, in so many public schools now, um, you know, sort of sanctioned from the top. So um, then we also, in the wake of Charlottesville, put together um, a memo to our board about what are new funding areas that we should be looking at? How can we, you know, make an even more direct response? Because um, anti-Semitism and hatred as a, um, let's say funding area has not been a direct funding area. We're more focused on, you know, creating positive Jewish experiences. And so we, we've proposed educational engagement appro approaches, direct combating of hatred, um, security challenges facing our grantees in the broader community, and also community relations and advocacy of four areas where we could um, potentially do new investments. And we actually are moving forward on most of those and are in, either have made grants or are in serious conversations with organizations in those areas. Um, so that's really, um, you know, the existing framework of our grant making. Secondly, we ask ourselves, should we use our public voice, if at all? And how do we do that? And we know that statements, especially you could be making a statement every day um, this year. So sometimes those can, can seem hollow, but at the same time, um, I do think that they serve a purpose uh, used effectively, um, especially at a time when government and other institutions are becoming less and less trusted. Foundations and nonprofits are actually one of the most trusted um, voices today in, in terms of institutions, and so we can help take some moral positions. And one of the things we did over the last few months 
um, that we've actually weighed in on racism and bigotry, the DACA Act, religious pluralism, but I think the thing we feel the most proud of is that we came together with um, 35 other foundations and other partners to create this video against hatred and anti-Semitism. Um, and of course, Charlottesville happened after that came out, so you could question how much of an impact it had, but I think it at least said we in the Jewish you know, philanthropic and nonprofit community are not going to just stand idly by and we care and we're willing to come together around this. Um, and when you're, I think when you're talking about how to use your voice, um, we ask ourselves a, a few questions. When is it appropriate to weigh in? When is it not? Um, what are the lines that we don't want to cross as an organization? How do we add value to the discourse rather than just adding another voice? Um, and we have played with developing concrete guidelines around this and ultimately at this point we found that every situation has required a different response that's appropriate to the moment so i don't have any very specific guidelines to share but these are some of the questions we're asking us um the third question we ask is what do we do with our networks and this is our grantee networks the young people that they serve um and also um the young adults, we, we were both a grant making and operating foundation. So we have a lot of young adults who, um, who relate directly through us. And so we have tried to um, create forums for them to come together and reflect and heal and build bridges. And so um, in the wake of Charlottesville, we, we had a, a whole, we partnered with uh, Repair the World and One Table and um, 70 other national and local partners to create together at the table. And it was an initiative to bring people together um, at the Shabbat dinner table to reflect on what had happened and what can we do and how do we, how do we reach beyond ourselves. Um, we also, the inauguration weekend, uh, partnered with uh, the Jim Joseph Foundation and some other grant of our grantees to create the weekend of hope, healing and service. Again, the idea of bring people together across boundaries and let them decide how they want to unleash their power to make change and also give them a chance to feel part of bigger than themselves, something bigger than themselves and to, to heal. Um, and then the fourth question is how do we help mo our networks mobilize to serve others? Um, in this regard, I, we believe that service and volunteerism is one of the best ways to engage with the other and to build bridges. Um, it's, I think Martin Luther King recognized this and it's why Democratic and uh, Republican presidents have turned to service as something not only for creating fairness and equity and solving problems, but really to build bridges across communities. So we've been working with Repair the World and Avodah and some of our other par grantee partners who um, are involved already in building racial um, equity and building educational equity to Help, help us be a, have a vessel for, for building bridges with other communities. And finally, um, are we walking our own talk? Are we supporting diversity enough through our grantees and in our own organization? Um, and we've uh, this year started funding Ben the Arc uh, to uh, support the Jews of Color Leadership Program. Um, we're ramping up our funding in the LGBT inclusion space. Um, We've actually, you know, in, in the non-Jewish world, we've, we've um, done some grants for, uh, for DACA and supporting those affected by uh, the change in the status on DREAMers. Um, and even beyond that, looking at um, accessibility for people with disabilities, et cetera. So we're trying to make sure that our own house is in order as a foundation and that we're doing the things that we should be doing to walk the talk. So just to close, the bottom line is I think you – you don't have to choose between staying on mission and being responsive to the issues of the day. I think there's a balance that you can strike um, between both. Um, and I think we're all sort of feeling the fierce urgency of now, but having thought and foresight and thinking through in advance and asking yourself these questions, I think helps address the urgency with, with care. Great, Lisa, thanks for such a thorough um, and, Sorry, and easy, no, and easy to follow <laughs> rubric. I think that was really helpful. Georgette, you want to take us behind the curtain with you? Thank you. Um, and thank you very much, um, um, Shira and Samantha, for organizing uh, 
this program. It's one of the reasons that I'm so pleased to be on, on the board of JFN. And thank you also to my colleagues on this panel. Now, as uh, Eliza mentioned in the introduction, um, I serve on the board of the Polonsky Foundation, which is our family foundation. But the Polonsky Foundation doesn't deal with these kinds of issues at all. The Polonsky Foundation is focused entirely on the humanities and higher education. So the connection to the kinds of issues that we're seeing today um, is really um, kind of an indirect connection. Um, we know that technology is necessary for progress, but the humanities are necessary for a functioning democracy. Now, that said, uh, even though the Polonsky Foundation is not involved with these issues because they're completely off target in terms of our mission, also it's a UK foundation, which means that it cannot give to anything that might be considered political in the US. So we cannot give to the ACLU, we cannot give to Third Way, we cannot give to a number of organizations because they would be considered as somehow the UK interfering with, uh, with US um, political processes. However, my husband and I are personally very deeply concerned with these issues. So unlike my colleagues on this panel, we do this kind of giving entirely personally. So let me, let me say a little something about our approach. First of all, I agree with, um, with what Adams, with what Aaron said, that Charlottesville was not the beginning of this issue, nor is it the beginning of how we began to address these kinds of issues. In fact, uh, I started addressing them um, 25 years ago when I founded the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. So this has been an ongoing form of philanthropy uh, for me and then my husband when, when I remarried some years after founding the Tannenbaum Center. But one of the things that certainly is driving our concern is the parallels between the rise of the Nazi party and the ultra-right in the US. And just to hit a few key points, uh, both started, uh, both emerged from a period of economic hardship. Both of them um, use scapegoating as a key vehicle for dehumanizing the other and to use Lisa's language for othering. Uh, in the case of the Nazis, it was Jews and other enemies of the state in, in terms of what we're seeing now. It's Muslims, it's refugees, it's Jews, it's immigrants, it's the media. So a lot of scapegoating going on. Um, in both cases, we had a pop populist leader who rose to the top by tapping into anger, fear, and status anxiety. Um, in one case, uh, it was Deutscher über alles, and today it's America first, but it's the same thing. Uh, we, in both cases, had a narcissistic leader that, um, that created a cult of personality. Um, propaganda. Uh, was a very prominent feature of the rise of the Nazi party, as well as what is going on today. Uh, in the case of the Nazi, the rise of the Nazis, we had Goebbels and, and the daily uh, dehumanization and propaganda that went on in Der Sturmer. Today, it's fake news, misinformation, disinformation, but above all, the, the constant repeating of the big lie a very important feature, both of the rise of the Nazi party and what we're seeing today. Um, stereotyping, dehumanization, the case in, among the Nazis of racial superiority and today white supremacy and the notion that America is a Christian nation. And of course, 
the notions that we had to somehow purify the country. In the case of Nazi Germany, it was a Judenrein Germany. And today it's clearing America of all illegal aliens and preferably some legal ones as well. Now, how do we address that in terms of our personal giving? We tend to address this through the lens of religion which is a little bit different from, from what you've been hearing from my colleagues. Because we see the misuse and abuse of religion as being very much at the source of these kinds of issues. And we also see religion as being part of the solution to these kinds of issues. So, I'm guilty of something that we were speaking about at our last JFN board meeting, namely Mongos and Mongoism. Are you familiar with the term Mongo? It means my own NGO. Because our approach to philanthropy, uh, our personal philanthropy is very hands-on. And what we keep doing is starting or organizations to address these issues. So I mentioned before the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding, which has been operating for 25 years and is very much focused on combating religious prejudice and religion-based violence. And in terms of one of its rapid responses to what we see going on is a combating extremism program but it also works through the education system, through workplaces, and through the role of religion and conflict resolution. The, the other organization is the Global Covenant of Religions, which is an organization that is focused entirely on delegit delegitimizing the use of religion as a justification for violence and extremism. Let's remember that the Ku Klux Klan, for example, started out as a Christian organization, uh, which was designed to preserve Christian brotherhood. And so many of uh, these organizations that spew hatred there is a religious element to it or, or a misuse of religious element to it. The most recent response, and this was our rapid response to the Syrian crisis, uh, was the founding of the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. Now, one, of, one part of the MFA mission is to debunk the myths about refugees. And many of these myths apply to immigrants as well. We do a lot of advocacy work and it's very interesting how difficult it is to get funding for advocacy. And yet one of the main tools that we need to combat what is going on today is advocacy. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we do a lot of work on the Hill and over and over and over again, the, the senators and the representatives with whom we deal are particularly interested in the fact that we are made up of now 90 organizations, mostly faith-based, but a number of secular ones as well. They are very interested in religious leaders speaking in one voice on these issues and they want those religious leaders to be in Washington because they need that cover. They need the cover of religious leaders in terms of acting to combat much of what we're seeing now, especially in, in, in relation to refugee policy, because that is um, what we deal with in particular. The other thing that is very important for funders to engage is the issue of counter messaging. We have to use all of the tools at our disposal to do counter messaging in terms of all of the falsehoods that are being repeated about refugees and immigrants and the kind of threat that they pose. And that certainly applies to anti-Semitism as well. We need to do videos, we need to use social media, but all of these things 
cost money. It is expensive to bring religious leaders from around the country to Washington. It is expensive to do videos. It is expensive to develop communications and counter messaging strategies. So these are all gaps that need to be addressed by the, by the philanthropic community. And to build further on the point, one of the points that Lisa was making about bringing people together, one of the things that we've learned is that basing counter messaging just on the facts has very little impact. That it is in fact contact and communication where people have the opportunity to meet each other, to get to know each other, that has the greatest impact on moving the needle in terms of public opinion. And public opinion is what we are going to need to build now. That will have to be the driver because we have an administration that is not going to take the lead in terms of um, toning down rhetoric and addressing uh, the terrible divisiveness that we see now. We are going to have to do it through public opinion, putting pressure on, on legislators and putting pressure on the executive. So this is uh, just a quick and dirty overview of what we are doing personally. And as we get into the Q&A, uh, I'll do a deeper dive into uh, some of the things that I've just reviewed now. Great, and thank you, Georgette, for bringing in the perspective of being an in, of acting more as an individual than as a trustee of a foundation in this way. And I think some of the strategies that you that you put out just now from Mongo's to cross-sector interdisciplinary work and um, other pieces are very important pieces for us to look at, um, particularly as we're balancing between like long haul immediate urgency, uh, some, some of these strategies are really important. Let's hear a little bit from Isaac about what's, what's going on over at the Nathan Cummings Foundation and what are some of your conversations and funding strategies looking like. And then we'll, um, I'll maybe pose a few questions to everybody and then we'll open it up for broader Q&A. Isaac? Great, thanks so much. And very grateful to JFN for hosting, uh, for Elisa for moderating and for all the participants for joining and my fellow panelists. Uh, so I am the Director of Voice, Creativity, and Culture at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Um, we uh, are a Jewish foundation rooted in the tradition of Jewish social justice and funding um, both in Jewish social justice and also in many other uh, uh, parts of uh, progressive movement building. Um, we have a racial and economic justice portfolio. We have, as I said, a, a voice, creativity, and culture portfolio, which funds in religious traditions and contemplative practices, as well as arts and culture. Uh, we have an inclusive clean economy portfolio that focuses on climate change and a corporate and political accountability portfolio, uh, which uh, integrates with our shareholder activism to advance change that we want to see in the world at the corporate level. Um, so uh, this moment, as folks have said, Charlottesville is, is new and isn't new. Um, so we have used this opportunity in the last year, uh, really seeing after the election, uh, to clarify our analysis, um, to clarify our intention, uh, and, and to think more about the vision for NCF as a whole and each of our portfolios. Um, the analysis piece I think is really important. Um, and I think that this is one of those uh, places where I wish uh, we would spend more time here uh, because we learn more about what could uh, be done when we spend some time thinking about how we got here. And the how we got here, I think, for NCF is related in a couple of ways. And, and one of them is the clear shift in um, the ability of a single person to bring home an income that supports their family um, or themselves. Uh, and an economic trend over the last 30 years that has uh, increased inequality in America, that has made um, 
it not only necessary for two people to work in a household, but uh, almost, you know, that doesn't make ends meet either. Um, you know, it is uh, an, a really big shift and one that I don't think we, you know, you go back 100, 150 years, um, this kind of shift is not really on the landscape without massive social unrest uh, in whatever country it's occurring in. Uh, second is the extraordinary and wonderful diversifying of America. Um, that we have uh, a, a growing population of people of color. Um, you know, there are, uh, I was just looking at a stat recently and I, I might uh, mess this one up, uh, but that uh, there are uh, three people of color being born in this country to every one white person. Um, and so the level of uh, change that is baked in for the future uh, in terms of our political landscape, uh, who's going to be showing up in schools, who is going to be needing services, et cetera, is way more impactful than we have even seen yet. We're at the edge of that uh, impact right now. Um, so, you know, white anxiety over these changes is just a factor of what's happening right now. And when you put the mix of the economic trends and the diversifying America together, um, plus the inability of democratically elected politicians uh, to address these issues, specifically the economic one, you get social movements that are ready to have more radical change. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, particularly in the voice creativity and culture portfolio, think a lot about culture. Um, and culture as a driving force for how we make sense of the world and also what is possible vis-a-vis -vis our politics to solve problems that we face. Um, and I think right now we imagine that we think that there really is a crisis of values and of value happening in American culture. Um, and I mean by a value, I mean that we don't know what we value and why or we have extreme differences over that. Um, and that means that our systems of value might, uh, you know, be invested in a sense of domination and extraction, like we are going to build and take, take from the earth what we need, we will take from people what we need, um, and that that, uh, that approach is where we find the link between our two core issues, inequality on the one hand and climate change on the other. Um, and so this approach, this, this culture of domination and extraction, uh, it links at the root uh, a problem, a problematic framework. And you can sort of see its exposure in, you know, the way we think about policies that conservatives advocate for um, in our government, um, where they are trying to free up people to extract and take what they want, um, thinking that over time that that will make the society better off. Um, and we might, we might disagree on that. So if you hold these things about economic trends, diversifying of America, a crisis in culture as features of the landscape, you have to think about then what shifts culture. And one of the things that we are really invested in, in, in addition to you know, supporting faith leaders uh, and arts and culture, culture makers to offer vision or another opportunity that takes us out of this domination and extraction framework, is thinking about social movements um, and how they shift culture and shift political environments. Um, and I think that one of the hard lessons that we've learned over the last few years is that the most powerful social movement in America right now is white nationalism. Uh, and I wanna get really specific about that because white nationalism is different than white supremacy. White supremacy is a system by which, you know, we would think of white people having more access to stuff. Sometimes that means Jews, sometimes it doesn't. Um, that they would have more access to better education. We would sort of have an expectation of their supremacy in the system. Um, white nationalism is an ideology uh, that showed up in Charlottesville. Um, it is, uh, you know, what showed up in the Oklahoma City bombing many years ago. Uh, the sense that, um, that people of color actually make America impure, and uh, so do Jews and that the important thing now is to purify the country. Um, there's an echo of something, I don't know, maybe you guys hear it too. 
Um, but this is, uh, this is a real challenge to all of us and to all of the priorities we have at NCF, all of our partners, the sense of a growing energy around white nationalism and what I perceive to be and, and many partners that we work with perceive to be some inadequate responses right now. Um, and I think for us, this means that we're going to invest in uh, multiracial social movements with uh, economic justice campaigns at their core. Uh, that we're going to also invest in the conditions that would make these alternative movements emerge and, and can sustain their work over time. Um, and specifically in the portfolio that I get to uh, be the steward of, we're thinking a lot about Jewish role in these movements. Um, in white nationalism, I think something that Eric Ward, who is a previous panelist on this series, has mentioned um, that in white nationalism, anti-Semitism is actually the root of this ideology. People in these movements had to make sense of what happened after the civil rights movement. How could these people that we imagine, people of color that were less than us, have succeeded in seizing the government enough to establish voting rights, to establish a whole set of civil rights protections, and to take away what we imagine to be our heritage? And, and that, those were the Jews. That was who was really doing the work. And so uh, when we think about um, Jewish role in these social movements, uh, I think we've, we've got to do better. Um, and I think that that got to do better comes on both Jews, I'll take my I'll take, and, and also on um, you know, the, the movements that we're a part of. Uh, we have not seen open anti-Semitism or an acknowledgement of it in the way that we have been seen in the last year for many years. Uh, so it, I have compassion for that understanding. And, and we are, as a funder, uh, thinking about the relationship of anti-Semitism to the social movements we fund. We're supporting a number of uh, conversations between uh, you know, racial justice advocates who are Jewish and racial justice advocates uh, who are not Jewish to sort of develop a shared analysis around this question. Um, hopefully, it will be a contribution to bridging some of the gaps in the intersectionality framework that many of us have found both challenging and an opportunity for building uh, cross-movement uh, relationships. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're also seeing this in our Jewish social justice groups that we fund, uh, whether it's Trua or Ben the Ark, Join for Justice or the RAC uh, or JFridge. Um, they're all, you know, thinking about this sort of how do you show up in a social movement that is increasingly led and populated by people of color to advance a new narrative? Um, and you know, the, the final thing, uh, like I'll say two last things. So we, our board approved uh, some additional resources in this moment, uh, like you know, many of my colleagues here on the call. Um, we have been thinking about sort of four emerging areas of interest for us as we were watching what our partners were doing. One of them is new forms of civic engagement. Um, one a good example of this might be the Momentum crew in Boston who are thinking about how do we rapidly scale movements right now. Uh, the conventional community organizing model, the block by block, one conversation by one conversation may not work for right now. So how do we train and onboard people so that decentralized movements can sort of, you know, jump up and, and really push back. Uh, we're thinking about building bridges across lines of difference. This is where that anti-Semitism work fits and also some investments in Muslim community infrastructure uh, and thinking about where are the ways that, that the parts of our movement where the bridges are not built that we need to do more bridge building and also who are the constituencies we have not built relationships with yet could have relationships with on issues of mutual concern. And this does include, you know, white working class folks, uh, folks who, you know, are thinking about this question of heritage and future for white people in America, but maybe don't have relationships with Muslims or African-Americans or others. Um, we're also thinking about safeguarding the truth. And this is a set of investments in uh, journalism, particularly led by people of color. And we're also thinking about resilience. And, uh, and this is a funding area that I've led. And um, in particular, this is what are the spiritual and religious practices, and uh, there are Jewish practices for this too, uh, that can offer a seedbed uh, for social transformation. 
And I'm, this is, you know, emerging out of work that I've seen unfold where folks who are doing the work on the edge, who are experiencing police violence, or they're experiencing uh, their family being deported, uh, what are their practices for staying whole, uh, as whole as possible, uh, as close to their uh, experiences, trauma as they can get without hurting themselves through the work that they're trying to do. Um, our Jewish community clearly is experiencing uh, new ways of interpreting our history right now and some of our own trauma around what's happening. Um, I've seen it in my local Jewish community and in, it's in me too. Um, and sometimes that fear can prevent us from, trans from transforming, from being part of a transformational strategy and having the equanimity to respond well in a moment where any tweet can throw us into a tailspin. So uh, we're investing some in that resilience framework. Um, and I guess to close, I'll say that, you know, there's, I was uh, reading uh, one that, that sort of classic story about, uh, you know, the, the Hasidic folks after the Baal Shem Tov had died over the weekend, I was reading the story and they're sitting around wondering, where's the Baal Shem Tov? We need the Baal Shem Tov now, this great Hasidic master to guide us in this moment. We don't, we don't have, him here and their master comes out from where he's sleeping and uh, says fools the Baal Shem Tov was here and he's not now but there is one in every generation and it is our job to find them and I think that that's part of what we're trying to do right is is open up the possibility that uh, the mystical the the prophetic is here actually it's within us um, it's within the movements that we have here, and our job is to try to clarify our purpose, clarify our analysis, and get to the point where we can let that emerge. Great. Thank you so much, Isaac, and thank all four of you. Um, I want to pull out a few themes that came up in the different presentations and toss them back to you for a little bit of back and forth, and then we'll open up wide for the Q&A, which I see is already starting to populate in the chat. Um, but I, Isaac, you spoke a lot about coalitions, movement building, which in some way is another, another, another piece of the balancing act here, building for the long term versus responding in the immediate term. Um, does anyone else want to comment on investments in coalitions, movement building, um, more relational approaches across communities? Georgette, go off mute so that we can hear you. Georgette, you need to turn mute off. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to say something about that since the Multi-Faith Alliance is a coalition. And as I mentioned, it involves something like 90 organizations. And it is a, it, uh, it is a coalition that does span many communities. Uh, we have many organizations. In fact, this started uh, as a Jewish response to the Syrian crisis, uh, which I initiated with JDC. And we created the Jewish Coalition for Syrian Refugees, which was then scaled up to a multi-faith alliance. But one of the most interesting components is the number of Syrian organizations that are part of this alliance and the way that they are working with Jews. And one of the things that we do is we are also part of other coalitions. For example, we are part of the Refugee Council USA. And um, Lisa, uh, spoke earlier about issuing statements and what do you want to respond to, what don't you want to respond to. So certainly one of the things that we do is we do issue statements whenever there is an executive order or some event that um, impacts uh, Syrian refugees, but of course they impact many other refugees and immigrants as well. We just happen to have carved out the space with Syrian refugees, but we make statements. Uh, part of our urgent response is that we, we join uh, amicus curiae briefs and so on. And the fact that you have so many organizations 
that are committing to address a particular problem because that is a requirement of joining the multi-faith alliance um, really um, speaks to the power of the faith-based and civil society collective. Great. Anyone else want to respond on uh, coalitions, building, move, movement building strategy? Um, I'll, I'll just jump in and say uh, two things. One is that uh, we're, we're actually, we're partnering with the Nathan Cummings Foundation to support uh, yeah, um, to support uh, in, in some of that resilience work that Isaac was talking about to support a, a, an activist circle of Jewish women of color um, and thinking a lot about um, places where uh, uh, Jews intersectional identities, whether as Jews of color or as um, LGBTQ Jews or um, you know, things like that can, can strengthen their perspectives and build solidarity relationships between Jews and uh, other communities who are, who are under threat. And secondly, um, and this is like still nascent, but we're, we're thinking hard. I talked earlier about that framework of um, thinking about the threats to democracy, um, about what are, the, what are the relationships that can be built in this moment within the Jewish community across otherwise polarized political lines, right? There are, uh, there are obviously a host of progressive Jews who are um, allied around, around a lot of these issues, but there's, there's a, a significant portion of, of right of center uh, Jews and Jewish foundations uh, who, um, while we may be tussling over policy issues under ordinary circumstances, um, may, be, uh, may be aligned with us around some of the core um, democracy, threats to democracy issues, and what are the opportunities for coalition building there, not only to work on those things, right, not only to work on voter rights and uh, um, uh, independent judiciary and, and, and freedom of the press, et cetera, but also to model uh, a more civil discourse um, around this and build relationships so that when we are back to, you know, tussling with each other around policy issues, we can do it in a um, in a more um, respectful and kind of mutually understanding way. So we're, we're thinking about that as well. Nice. Great. Um, I've got, I'm going to ask two more questions to the panel and then we're going to open it up. Um, so for the people on the call, feel free to populate your questions in the Q&A box and we're going to, we're going to get to them in just a moment. I see that there are a few there. Um, I want to hear a little bit from each of you about what you're learning through this, um, both through the rapid response process and also through the maybe making kinds of grants you've never made before or figuring out these rubrics, are, rubrics uh, for how to respond, when to respond, and what measure to respond. What are some of the things you feel like you're learning in this moment? I'll jump in. For, I'll jump in for that, um, and it maybe I think it, it goes builds off of what Aaron just said, which is that um, we've got to be building uh, relationships of trust. And I, I think that one of the things that is the most difficult about this moment is the lack of trust in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's we don't trust the media anymore. We don't trust people who are different from us, the, the deliberate you know, demonization of, of other groups, we don't know who to trust. Um, and I do think that this challenge um, also presents a really uh, major opportunity for our community because um, both within the Jewish community, if we can come together, partly unfortunately out of fear and, um, and concern for our own safety, but also to recognize that the Jewish values that animate us are actually the drivers of the movement that needs to be built. Um, I, I look at the work that we're, that we're doing with teens and college students and young adults um, as actually movements for positive change in the world. And I think we have to go back, um, I think it was Aaron who said, you're doing something with Jewish Education Project. We need to go back to like fundamental Jewish civic education and say like, what are the values that animate us as Americans, as Jews, and what are the, the tools of democracy and the tools of our religion that we can use to be voices for positive change and to build bridges across 
our own community and have civil discourse across our own differences and model that for others. And then once we can actually have civil conversations and under listen to each other, then build bridges um, to other communities. So rebuilding that trust, rebuilding the, the civil discourse, um, I mean, I think it's just core to everything that we have to do as, um, as a community. Um, going with that, I, I feel like we have language challenges. One of the things I'm learning, I mean, this one of the questions that I see that came up in the chat was white supremacy, white nationalism. Um, I mean, I'm learning, you know, new language here. Uh, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, we had Ku Klux Klan going around. Like, to me, that was white supremacy. But that's actually white nationalism. And then there's this whole mind, you know, mindset of white supremacy as something you know, more pervasive. And so I, I feel like we don't have a common language anymore um, uh, between generations, between people who are living in different parts of the country and from different political. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some need to rebuild language about what does our Judaism mean? And then just broader cultural language and where do we fit in? Are, are we white supremacists if we are a largely white community? I mean, that's language that's out there right now. So I think mm -hmm. this uh, trying to understand and, and have a new language and a shared language is really important for us um, as a community. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would say is, um, you know, collective action is hard. <laughs> and so um, even I've been sitting in conversations with uh, many of the people on this panel and I'm sure other people on the calls and like, well, where are we going to act together? Where should we not act together? Should we just be learning together? Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to, um, to do collective action. And same when you're talking about building a movement and investing in collective action. Um, I think, Georgia, what you've done with this multi-faith alliance is amazing. Um, but it's not always easy, even with people of um, goodwill and, and common concerns, to figure out what do we act around. And... Um, so I, th I think that has been sort of a, a hard part, a, a difficult part of this, of this environment is what do we come together around? I was shocked, I have to just say, when we worked on um, this uh, video, com Combating Anti-Semitism, of how many people felt like they couldn't get on board with it. I mean, how much more apple pie can you be than that? We don't believe in, you know, we oppose anti-Semitism and bigotry, but for various reasons, people feel constrained by a lot of different things. And, um, you know, finding the areas where we can come together and have shared voices and stand for something as a Jewish community, it's really important. Mm. Mm. Right. Wow. Well, That's great. Um, it, would it be all right if I jumped in with what am I learning? Yes. Um, you know, really, I'm so grateful for what you just said, Lisa. I mean, I, I really resonated with everything. Um, and I'm experiencing each of those issues in different ways. Um, and uh, I guess I, I would say, like, one of the things that I'm really learning and have been trying to learn over the last five years of my career is the necessity to engage complexity as complexity rather than a either or, you know, good, bad, white, black sort of situation. Um, one of those things is whiteness, right? Like I am a white person. I am also Jewish. I'm also male. I'm also from an interface family, right? So there are all of these different things that come, these different complexities. And I think that's actually what the term intersectionality is meant to do in its original definition before it got sort of added on to. Uh, and, and began to become a political football. Um, so I think in being able to engage that complexity um, is really critical. And I think that this relates to some of the pre-readings where uh, the desire for certainty uh, on behalf of the funder of a particular project uh, or even partial certainty <laughs> uh, is probably unrealistic with the things that will make the biggest impact um, because they will be new and we won't be certain. Uh, and, and so engaging the complexity of like the reality that we also have to be careful with how the resources go out because we need to steward them well and everything. And then I guess the last thing I'd say on that is that I've been noticing um, how refreshing it is to be in a non-punitive space talking about these questions. <laughs> 
and uh, how rare it is actually among so many of us that uh, uh, focus on that work. Like we know that there are punishments around the corner for a certain kind of language or a certain approach. And um, I wonder about, you know, and I think this is where the resilience work and the spiritual grounding work really comes into play, which is how do you transition from a sense of, of, of shame and punishment uh, around these questions of, did we do enough? You're a racist, you're an anti-Semite, to something that's uh, more open and generative. Um, and I think what the ground starts with relationship, but there are, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And trust, right, as you said, Lisa. So I'll, I'll jump in with um, what I've learned, uh, but I'm not going to repeat what Lisa and Isaac have already said because um, I agree, I agree with all of that. So I'll just add this little bit to it. I think one of the things that we need to do is get away from binary thinking because I think Isaac, that's, that's very much what you were saying that we get into trouble with binary thinking. But on the positive side, what I have learned um, in the most dramatic way is how one can change hearts and minds by helping to alleviate terrible human suffering. And we have seen this over and over again in terms of Syrians and Israelis working together, Syrians and Jews working together, how all of the indoctrination and how all of the mutual suspicion and mistrust mm -hmm. and hatred even just melt away, it works. So that's what I will add to the learnings. Um, and, and I'll just jump in and, and echo a lot of what my very smart colleagues have said uh, and say that I think one of the things that I'm, that I'm trying very hard to hold on to is this like keeping soft eyes, right? I think that there are a lot of different <laughs> frames in play Right? There's a progressive movement building frame. There's a white nationalism and anti-Semitism frame. There's a um, civil discourse and fighting polarization frame. There's the, you know, the, the supporting pillars of democracy frame. Um, and I, I, I don't think that any of them are right. I'm pretty sure they're, uh, they're complementary. And I think it's a, a really like what I'm trying to, to hold on to in, in conversations with a lot of people is naming, like figuring out what, which one we're operating in in a particular conversation or which ones we're bringing to a particular conversation. Uh, because I think we, the, like the times when I'm talking past other people are often times where I'm talking democracy, they're talking combating hatred. And I'm like, oh, right, those two things are, they're, they're not exactly the same, but they're parts of, a, they're parts of an interconnected and interdependent puzzle. Um, and if we can disentangle them, we can talk about how they, how they relate to each other and how, uh, how they can work together in, in, uh, in responding right now. So that's mm -hmm. my, uh, my only other observation here. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing your learning. We now actually have some questions uh, both in the chat and in the, uh, the Q&A. And I'll ask people to use the Q&A bucket if you can. Um, but I'm, the first question I'm going to take is from Jason Broska, who's asking the entire panel, other than Isaac, other than Isaac um, if you view white nationalism as the highest level of concern at the moment. Have you all? kind of constructed your hierarchy of concerns in a similar way or perhaps in different ways? I'll, uh, since I'm, I'm, I'm already unmuted, um, I'll very quickly, like I am very concerned about white nationalism. I think it's um, emblematic of a broader pro problem that's going on. I, I can't say that I have my own personal hierarchy, um, but um, I think I'm more concerned about the the polarization, the demonization, the ad hominem attacks, um, the targeting of individuals and making them afraid that has enabled white nationalism to flourish. And so mm -hmm. it's, I, I feel like that's somewhat more containable white nationalism than 
the the seeping into broader society and kids going to school and saying, go back to, you know, Mexico and you're this and you're that. So um, that's like a sim. I mean, I know it's not a symptom because I, and Isaac brought Eric Ward to a setting where we were and it was very eye opening that anti-Semitism is the heart of these, these movements. So I am concerned about it, but I think it being uncontained is the thing that I'm the most upset about. And while I have the floor, I do want to say this, this issue of the ad hominem attacks. I think one of the things I've learned is we've got to listen just like soft eyes. We've got to listen with, we have to have much more active and empathetic listening and not be attacking people personally in this environment. Well, the ad hominem attacks are really part of the dehumanization process. And once you dehumanize the other and you make them uh, less than human, it's a very short step from dehumanization to violence. And that is the real risk. That and apocalyptic language, the children of light versus the children of darkness, these are the kinds of things that are a tremendous risk. Um, so I'm going to start flowing in some of the other questions that are in the Q&A box. Philip, Philip Dar Daravoff asks, Isaac, you use the term intersectionality to describe the breadth of your work. I've heard this term used to describe why some groups include anti-Israel po positions in their policy statements and actions. What concerns do you have about anti-Israel anti inclusion and intersectionality and how do we respond? Mm, yeah, uh, well, I started a little bit to answer that earlier, but I'll start by saying like, uh, I'm somebody who cares about Israel. Uh, I have lived there, I, I love it. Uh, we, NCF actually does some support for progressive groups in Israel too. Uh, it is part of our DNA to think about Israel as, uh, you know, uh, uh, of this foundation's identity and, and mine personally. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the room uh, when uh, the issue of Israel uh, threatened to uh, pull apart allies that should be allies, actually, like deep down, um, and watched, uh, you know, dynamics of race and anti-Semitism and of course the issue of Israel playing out and gender uh, playing out over this issue. Um, I think it's going to be another, you know, it's going to be our lot right now. 10, 20 years later, will we still be talking about how Israel shows up in the social progressive social movements of our day? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think about it um, in this way. Um, and this is really just listening to how many of the Jewish social justice partners on the ground are, are engaging this question which is that first, um, if you want somebody to listen to your concerns, you have to have a relationship with them. Um, and you have to be with them too. So uh, looking back at what happened with the Black Lives Matter platform 18 months ago, uh, you know, and, and how, uh, you know, it roiled our community, um, understandably, uh, it also, uh, we didn't have, and maybe don't yet have the kinds of relationships we need on the ground to be able to call the question of what really happened there um, and to understand this moment as one in which uh, we can win together, not just on our own. Um, I'll also say that like, it's, it's not a simple challenge, it's not a simple thing to engage right now. Uh, it, you know, and I think that in the end, Jews will need to be a part of these social movements, not just for our values, but for our security and the future of a, of a country that is mostly led by people of color. And that the question of Israel should begin to come up in those, uh, and is coming up, but mostly in op-ed pages and not enough in private conversations among trusted allies. Uh, and that, as that begins to come up, I think that you might see a shift in how this, this work unfolds. Um, and I just encourage, you know, looking at your question um, to uh, be careful of the definition of intersectionality as one in which it is really just talking about Jews' experience around Israel and these movements. Like, 
it's actually a framework for understanding a much more deeper, much deeper way of, of how oppression moves in lots of different ways. And um, I would listen hard on that one and then begin to think about, okay, so how does this anti-Semitism thing uh, factor in? How does the Israel question factor in? And um, it is a very live conversation and one that we're going to continue to engage with our partners uh, for a while. Great. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I'm going to bring in a question from, uh, and Philip says, thank you, uh, from Ben Binswanker. Um, and Ben says, most of the strategies that are being discussed here seem like sensible ways to build strength among people and groups and potential allies that are already inclined to oppose white nationalism and anti-Semitism. Is anybody working on the rela on relationship building events or messaging campaigns directed at the 25% of the voting population that may be deemed fellow travelers with the white nationalists or white men over 55 who seem most open to white nationalist arguments or the four fifths of the Republican Party members who seem to support the polarizing messages coming from the current administration. Do you believe it's possible to persuade these groups or are you suggesting that resources must first be devoted to the, the counter forces? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and say, uh, like, the, the data seem to suggest that it's really tough to persuade these folks. Um, at the same time, part of our uh, support for the Resetting the American Table project that I mentioned earlier, um, which is about, you know, working in a, a corner of Southwest with... I think you froze. Aaron, can we get you back? Oh, no. Shira, is there anything we can do to get Aaron back into the conversation? Um, I think it's something on his end. So why don't we move to another? Okay, I'm going to move to the next question, but as soon, or I'm going to move if anyone else wants to respond to Ben's question about um, kind of reaching beyond the, you know, our, our, our allies and people who share our views to go to the people that are far to the other side. Does anyone else want to respond to that? I'll just, I'll say two things. One, I just recently became aware of a, a small pilot effort to actually bring together African-American leaders and sort of white Confederate, I can't remember the exact name of the organization. Um, someone who's associated with the Holocaust Museum is, is doing a pilot effort that if it works, they will try in other places. But I think it's very small. I tend to believe that, um, you've got like the large middle and it's at least 80%, 90%. And then you've got these extremes on either side and it's going to be very, very hard to persuade the people on the extremes. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, would, I don't characterize this group that he's talking about necessarily, you know, white men over 55, um, which, you know, includes my husband. <laughs> um, though he definitely does not sympathize with white nationalists. Um, as extreme, so I, I think there is probably a way to bring some of those folks more into, uh, you know, mainstream and less sympathetic. Um, but I, I feel like there's so much work to do in the middle and building bridges among, you know, the people who actually uh, don't have those views that um, in terms of prioritization, I would not start there. I think that uh, Lisa has just made a very important point. Um, I'd like to just add a study that was done by British Futures on responses to immigration and refugees, which I think is very, very much on point. They found that you had 25% of the population that was totally opposed, and you had 25% of the population that was totally in favor, and then you had the 50% that they referred to as the anxious middle that, that wanted to feel better about immigration and refugees, but they had a lot of anxieties, um, you know, terrorism, uh, negative economic impact, and so on. But other, other research has found that there are specific kinds of messaging that can move the needle 
for that anxious middle so that you can move them toward the end of the spectrum that we want to see them on. So I just wanted to add that data point to what Lisa was saying. Yeah, I, I guess I would say that um, we are probably going to see an increase in adherence to white nationalist ideologies and movements um, as they come out of the closet and appear to have momentum and also somebody who's willing to say that they're very fine people in the White House. Um, so if our job probably is not to convince them, the leaders of that movement, but to establish potentially a bulwark against that among communities that do have relationships or are closer um, to, uh, you know, closer get, but might not be uh, accessed right now by the current um, by the current movement. So I think that's a good good idea. Um, it is very important that the messengers of that be authentically representing uh, interests that the folks you're trying to go talk to have. I think we've seen a lot of this work actually not work out so well in Israel uh, as we've tried to cross the kind of bridges that feel uncrossable. And then if, if we're willing to learn, if we're willing to change uh, also in that uh, encounter, uh, then it might have more potential. Um, but it's, it's very hard to do. It's just very hard to do. And I, I, as folks have said, the research, I'm not sure, supports, you know, the possibility of that uh, being an impactful use of resources just yet. Lisa, you're on mute. Sorry. Aaron was gone. I'm trying to find Aaron's whereabouts, but Aaron seems to have disappeared again. We're going we're gonna to hold space for Aaron to join us whenever he can. Um, I'm going to bring in the last question. This is going to be our last question um, for, for this panel. Oh, Aaron, you are back. I am. Sorry. Excellent. I'm no problem. Aaron, take us back to that corner of Wisconsin, and, um, <laughs> and then we'll move on into the conversation. That corner of Wisconsin, five hours south of where I was born. Um, yeah. So, uh, so uh, we. So part of our part of our intention in, in funding that effort uh, was to was to see like what's what's actually possible. I don't think, in answer to Ben's question, I haven't seen any evidence that it's a messaging issue. Right? I don't know that that this is something we're going to win through um, art messaging. I think it's something if we're going to win, we're going to win through relationship building. I mean, that's a very long term. Plan. So we're we're eager to learn uh, from that that experiment we set at the American table, and uh, um, yeah, that was that was that was all I wanted to say. Great. I'm going to bring us into the last question we have from Andy Kastner, and Andy asks, um, I'm wondering if any of the panelists can speak about how they inculcate, foster, and course correct the culture within their foundations to enable fast or nimble response to issues as they arise in civil society. So this is more about um, navigating the inner workings of your foundations and the places where um, I think Lisa started us off on this theme, you know, we want to be mission focused and metric oriented and consistent and sometimes that desire and that positive aspiration also makes us risk averse, not nimble, unable to kind of shift in the moment. How are, how is that being navigated at your, inside your foundations and what what roles maybe have you played in, in trying to facilitate some culture shift around that? That, that was not intended as a conversation stopper, but it seems to have <laughs> stalled everybody in their tracks. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in and I'll say that I am definitely the outlier in our foundation and I've failed. That's why we do this kind of stuff with personal giving. I, Georgette, I really want to thank you for saying that. I think that's a great thing for all of us to hear and to understand that they're, um, you know, that foundations are mighty forces for change and there's also often limits to where they can go and how quickly they can steer and pivot and um you know that i think that was a very helpful 
helpful reminder to all of us. Does anyone else want to talk about um, internal conversations or um, helping create more space for nimble responses? I mean, I, I, this is Aaron. I'll, I'll just say that uh, I think we're actually well positioned culturally to be nimble in responding. The trick, and, and there are certain, like very early on, we made some fairly rapid grants in response to social impact organizations that had quick, actionable ideas. At the same time, we're, uh, we are with those soft eyes trying hard to figure out where, where the best quick response is. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a, um, you know, wanting to do a, uh, uh, some both and, right? Some quick response where there are obvious good ideas and some um, keeping powder dry to make sure that uh, we're, we're able to respond in the medium and long term. Because just in, in the same way that Charlottesville wasn't the beginning of anything, right? It was at best the middle. Um, uh, this, this is not a problem that the, the problems that we're, we're wrestling with right now, which Charlottesville is symptomatic are problems that are going to take many years to resolve. You know, I think about the, the Federalist Society, uh, started in 1982 and was a very smart long-term play on, uh, of, of, um, uh, right-leaning judicial activism, that was a generation in the making. Similarly with uh, the, 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 the Freedom to Marry campaign started in 1984. Um, and that, you know, the arc from 1984 to 2015 was not one that people would have seen then. Though I think there's a, there's a real tension between being quick to respond and being in it for the long haul. Mm. Okay. I think part of uh, quick response um, it's very practical, and, and it does hark back to one of the, one of the pre-readings, and that is uh, you need to be willing to fund what others aren't willing to fund at first. You need to be willing to fund the startup effort, and you need to be willing to stick with it until others join you. Yeah, I, I have two thoughts on this. One is I'm just, I'm very fortunate to work for um, philanthropists who are extremely nimble and willing to take risks. So I, I haven't had to do any culture change, but um, I would say a couple things. One relates uh, also to the pre-reading, which is, um, actually, I'm not, remember, not sure if it was that article or the other one, but um, we need to believe in leaders and institutions, and we need to make general support grants that enable them to be strong and they themselves to be nimble in these environments. And, um, you know, I see a trend, unfortunately, towards more restricted funding. And I think if we build strong institutions in Jewish life that are about speaking out on Jewish values, building leaders for the future, investing in, in the civic and uh, you know, health of our, of our community, um, they will be able to be nimble in responding. And so I, you know, I'd like to make a, a plea for investing general long-term operating support for uh, leaders and organizations that, that can build a, a strong fabric for our community. Um, and the other piece I would say is um, start having the conversations now, like, uh, you know, Isaac talked about analysis, educate your board, talk to your team about what, what's coming down the pike. Um, and, and I think it's true. We are doing, I always like to say we're working at three levels simultaneously. We're doing the short term play. We're thinking about the medium term, but we are also looking at the long term. And to be able to hold all three of those simultaneously, you have to have an internal culture where there's constant learning, where there's conversations with the board about priorities and how to balance sort of this risk portfolio among the short, medium, and long term. Great. Well, we are almost at the end of time. I want to give each of you a minute to offer any reflections or summary con con comments that you'd like. Um, and we'll start with Aaron. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for, to, to JFN for convening this group, uh, to, to my colleagues on the panel. I feel like uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to have had soft eyes and uh, Lisa, alluded to soft ears in this conversation. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, 
uh, excited to see what, um, what emerges from this and um, among our colleagues who are participating in the webinar. And uh, um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you. Great, Isaac? Uh, you know, after the election, one of the things that, you know, came up for me and a number of people in my community were, was like, it, it doesn't, you don't have to make a big change to make a real impact. You can clarify where you sit who you are, what your identity is, uh, and deepen the impact where you already are. Um, I think there is a, like a move in our culture to, or a sort of groove, uh, a rut even, in our culture that we have to become new. Uh, and I don't think we need to. I think we just need to get better where we are, go deeper where we are. Um, and that that ecosystem that emerges from a clarity of purpose, um, from an intentionality that is really practiced and focused um, will respond in this moment in the right way. Great. Georgette? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eliza. Thank you, all of you. I think I'm going to use my minute um, to talk about those Jewish values that um, have been referenced numerous times in the course of this webinar. So I would like to close with some of those. Um, as a child of Holocaust survivors and as a refugee myself, um, I resonate very deeply to remembering that once we too were strangers and what that means. Um, our obligation to care for the stranger, to provide refuge, um, Leviticus 19.16, thou shalt not stand by idly while the blood of your brother cries out from the earth. And finally, and most important, the great contribution that Jews made to civilization. That is the notion that every human being is made in the sacred image of God. If you truly believe that, then there is no room for demonization and othering. Great, and Lisa? Um, okay, I'll make three quick points. One is um, just to reiterate that I, I don't believe in dichotomous thinking. I, I, binary thinking, as somebody called it, I think we can um, deepen the work that we're doing with our existing organizations and stay on mission and also be responsive and nimble at the same time. Um, to going along the theme of um, Jewish values, uh, I, I think, you know, all of Torah is on one foot, is love your neighbors yourself, and we have to um, look at our own community and our neighbors and be compassionate with them and, and also broaden our definition of who our neighbors are and how we're going to love them and respect them. And um, building on yet another theme that emerged here. So we have soft eyes, uh, soft ears, and soft heart. And I think mm. um, if we go into this with open heart heartedness, um, also to, to feel the pain of the people out there who we completely disagree with their positions and who maybe are coming from a place of anger and hate. Um, a lot of people are in pain in our country and uh, I think we need to be you know, kinder, more compassionate. And hopefully that will reverberate out to, to others in our country and to our leaders. Great. Well, we're exactly at time. I want to thank all four of our panelists, Georgette Bennett, Lisa Eisen, Isaac Luria, and Aaron Dorfman for um, giving of their wisdom and their candor and their thought process. Um, I want to thank JFN for hosting this conversation and for sparking so many thoughtful and uh, exciting conversations. Shira, do you want to say anything uh, to close us out? Just thank you. Thank you so much, Aliza. Thank you to you. You just did a fabulous job moderating this important conversation. Um, you know, this, this is it, this, whole session is being recorded and we will post on our website. So, so please pass it around to others you think would be um, interested in, in learning from this. And hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation, but thank you to everybody. Thank you.